After sacking Shechem, Jacob finally gets around to taking his family the rest of the way into the promised land. But how far does he get before more tragedy strikes? Today we'll be reading chapters 35 and 36 of Genesis as we wrap up the story about Shechem as God invites Jacob and his family to move forward and to begin anew. Forget everything you think you know. Beginnings always arise from other endings, and so these chapters will begin a new cycle in the story of the ancestors. We left off last time after the sons of Jacob had just sacked the city because of the crime against their sister Dinah. And now they are called to leave this place of death and destruction and go to Bethel. And if you recall the meaning of the word, this refers to the abode of God, a place where God has become present to the other ancestors in the past. And so we ask the Lord to bless our reading of these stories and give us wisdom and understanding. God said to Jacob, go up now to Bethel. Settle there and build an altar there to the God who appeared to you while you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob told his family and all the others who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods that you have among you. Then purify yourselves and put on fresh clothes. We are now to go up to Bethel, and I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in my hour of distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. They therefore handed over to Jacob all the foreign gods in their possession and also the rings they had in their ears. Then, as they set out, a terror from God fell upon the towns round about, so that no one pursued the sons of Jacob. Thus Jacob and all the people who were with him arrived in Luz, that is, Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and named the place Bethel, for it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Death came to Rebekah's nurse Deborah, she was buried under the oak below Bethel, and so it was called Alan Bakuth. On Jacob's arrival from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, You whose name is Jacob shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he was named Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, indeed an assembly of nations, shall stem from you, and kings shall issue from your loins. The land I once gave to Abraham and Isaac, I now give to you, and to your descendants after you will I give this land. Then God departed from him. On the site where God had spoken with him, Jacob set up a memorial stone, and upon it he made a libation and poured out oil. Jacob named the site Bethel, because God had spoken with him there. This passage begins with God telling Jacob to leave Shechem. I mean, there wouldn't be much there left anyway. It's destroyed. And the Lord tells him to travel to Bethel and reminds him that this was the place where he had appeared to him when he was fleeing his brother Esau so many years ago. And so in many ways, this acts as a bookend to Jacob's spiritual journey. This was also the place where God had first appeared to Abraham and where he had pitched his tent. Now, it is interesting that Jacob is told for him and his family to get rid of all the idols that they have with them and all the jewelry that pertains to the foreign gods. Of course, remember that Rachel had stolen her father's idols, and I'm sure they must have picked up a number of other ones while they were living so close to the Canaanites and were really under their bad influence. And so they are told then to leave everything, change their clothes, and prepare themselves to go to this sacred place. And this ritual speaks to a deeper meaning as well. They are to recommit themselves to the one true God and to remove themselves everything, the teachings, the practices, and the behaviors of the Canaanites. This is further illustrated in the instruction to purify or wash themselves and change their clothes. Remember the last we heard of the sons of Jacob, they were killing and plundering. So both literally and figuratively, they would have been covered with blood. Later, Israelite readers of the story would be familiar with purification rites and understand the meaning within the law by the time that this is written. Washing and changing was a sign of them turning back to God, and from a ritual perspective, allowing them to enter into the presence of God. And Bethel has become a holy site. In this context, they're removing the filth that they took on in Shechem. Jacob and his family traveling to Bethel also seems to begin the custom of traveling to this place as a pilgrimage. We're also told, in spite of Jacob's fear that their enemies would attack and defeat them, based on their attack on the town, a great fear descends on them instead. Even though they would have greater numbers, they don't dare go against the scheming house of Jacob. 
When they do arrive at Bethel, Jacob builds an altar and rededicates it as Bethel, or as some translations say, El Bethel, which would be translated as the God of Bethel, or the God of the house of God. And we are reminded again of the time God appeared to him. It is also recorded that Rebekah's nurse Deborah died during this trip, and she is buried under the oak, which would have been where Abraham invoked the Lord, showing that this was indeed a sacred place. The next few verses seem to be a continuation of the story from chapter 32, rather than where they sit in the text, giving us more detail regarding the blessing that Jacob wrestled from God, or his angel. This is indicated as verse 9 starts by telling us that this happened on his arrival from Padan Aram, which is where Laban lived. As we read the full blessing, his name is changed from Jacob to Israel, and he has promised to be the father of a great nation. However, there seems to be a little bit of a discrepancy here, as then Jacob sets up a pillar and consecrates it and then names that place Bethel even though we were told that the wrestling event took place at Peniel. And so these both of those stories seem to have been combined into this one text about his family coming to Bethel. And so, with this little flashback, let us continue and see what happens as they leave. Then they departed from Bethel, but while they still had some distance to go on the way to Ephrath, Rachel began to be in labor and to suffer great distress. When her pangs were most severe, her midwife said to her, Have no fear, this time too, you have a son. With her last breath, for she was at the point of death, she called him Ben-Oni. His father, however, named him Benjamin. Thus Rachel died, and she was buried on the road to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Jacob set up a memorial stone on her grave, and the same monument marks Rachel's grave to this day. Israel moved on and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder. During this trip, Rachel goes into labor, and gives birth to their final son, whom she names Ben-Oni, which means the son of my affliction, or my vigor. And yet Jacob calls him Benjamin, the name that we are more familiar with, meaning the son of my right hand. And in this tragic story, Rachel dies during childbirth, and so she is buried there on the road between Bethel and Ephrath. And Jacob erects a pillar, which could be seen as a grave marker or tombstone. But before we go any further, I'd like to talk a little bit about where Rachel is actually buried, because there's some debate about it. And so I'll summarize an article that I read by Professor Aaron Dembski, which talks about where she might be buried based on the biblical evidence. So there is a holy site near Bethlehem known as Rachel's tomb, believed to have been built there sometime in the 4th or 5th century, and has been a site of pilgrimage for all three of the Abrahamic religions. But is she actually buried there? As far as we know, most likely not. And in fact, some biblical scholars are not sure that this is even the right place geographically. While tradition says that she is, what can we learn from the scriptural evidence? Bethel is near Ramah, north of Jerusalem, while Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. So why do some place her tomb further north instead of the traditional site? The verse does not say that she died in Ephrath, modern-day Bethlehem, but on the road to it, which could be anywhere between Bethel and Ephrath. We are also told that she died shortly after they left Bethel, while they still had a long way to go, which would indicate that they were most likely closer to Bethel than to Bethlehem. In 1 Samuel 9-10, through 10, Samuel travels to her tomb, which is said to be in the territory of Benjamin, which is in the north. Based on his travels, this seems to place at a short distance south of Bethel. Also in Jeremiah 31-14, we are told of a voice in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. This is understood symbolically as Rachel crying out from her grave, and this too agrees with the passage in Samuel in terms of location. It would also make sense for her to be buried in the territory of Benjamin, who is the other focus of the story that we just read in Genesis. The author concludes that her tomb is most likely near a place called Rama Ramatayim Zophim, a short distance south of Bethel on the road to Bethlehem. And so their journey would eventually continue, assuming that they would first perform the traditional mourning rites for Rachel, before they sojourn to Ephrath. And we are told that they settle in Migdal Adair, which is believed to be near modern-day Bethlehem. And so Jacob's journey, or at least this part of his journey, is concluded with a few genealogies, both of him and also his brother Esau. We'll read his first because it ends with the death of their father Isaac. While Israel was encamped in that region, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, when Israel heard of it, he was greatly offended. The sons of Jacob were now twelve, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, 
Issachar and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's maid, Bilhah, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Leah's maid, Zilpah, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Jacob went home to his father Isaac at Mamre in Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. The lifetime of Isaac was 180 years, then he breathed his last. After a full life, he died as an old man and was taken to his kinsmen. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. We pretty much know of all of Jacob's sons at this point, but there are a few things that we need to point out. We begin this genealogy with this bizarre report of Reuben laying with Bilhah, who was Rachel's maidservant and Jacob's concubine. And technically, I guess she would kind of be Reuben's stepmother. We are only told that Jacob was greatly offended by this, but it will be brought up later, and we will see that Reuben in some ways loses the blessing of the firstborn because of this action, for this would be a great challenge against the authority of his father. And so we now have three of Leah's sons on Jacob's bad side. Eventually, Jacob returns to the house of his forefathers in Mamre and was there, along with his brother Esau, to bury their father Isaac. When Ishmael was mentioned in the burial of Abraham, we saw that his genealogy followed immediately after. And so we have the same literary structure here. And so we will hear of Esau's genealogy. But be prepared. This is a long one. These are the descendants of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his wives from among the Canaanite women. Adah, daughter of Elon the Hittite, Ohalabamah, granddaughter through Anna of Zibion the Hivite, and Basamath, daughter of Ishmael, and sister of Navaioth. Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, Basamath bore Ruel, and Ohalabamah bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, as well as his livestock comprising various animals and all the property he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to the land of Seir, out of the way of his brother Jacob. Their possessions had become too great for them to dwell together, and the land in which they were staying could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the highlands of Seir. Esau is Edom. These are the descendants of Esau, ancestor of the Edomites, in the highlands of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, son of Esau's wife Adah, and Ruel, son of Esau's wife Basemath. The sons of Eliphaz were Taman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Esau's son Eliphaz had a concubine, Timnah, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the descendants of Esau's wife Adah. The sons of Ruel were Nahath, Zarah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the descendants of Esau's wife, Basemath. The descendants of Esau's wife, Ohalibamah, granddaughter through Ana of Zibion, whom she bore to Esau, were Jewish, Jalam, and Korah. The following are the clans of Esau's descendants. The descendants of Eliphaz, Esau's firstborn, the clans of Taman, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. These are the clans of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. They are descended from Adah. The descendants of Esau's son, Ruel. The clans of Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the clans of Ruel in the land of Edom. They are descended from Esau's wife, Basemath. The descendants of Esau's wife, Ohalibamah. The clans of Jewish, Jalam, and Korah. These are the clans of Esau's wife, Ohalibamah, daughter of Anah. Such are the descendants of Esau, that is, Edom, according to their clans. The following are the descendants of Seir the Horite, the original settlers in the land, Lotan, Shobal, Zibian, Ana, Dishan, Ezer, and Dishan. They are the Horite clans descended from Seir in the land of Edom. Lotan's descendants were Hori and Heman, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. Shobal's descendants were Alvan, Mahanath, Ebal, Shepo, and Onan. Zibian's descendants were Ai and Ana. He is the Ana who found water in the desert while he was pasturing the asses of his father Zibian. The descendants of Ana were Dishan and Aholabamah, daughter of Ana. 
the descendants of Dishon were Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Cheron. The descendants of Ezer were Bilhan, Zavan, and Akan. The descendants of Dishon were Uz and Aran. These are the Horite clans, the clans of Lotan, Shobal, Zibian, Ana, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishan. They were the clans of the Horites, clan by clan in the land of Seir. The following were the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Bela, son of Beor, became king in Edom. The name of his city was Dinhaba. When Bela died, Jobab, son of Zerah from Basra, succeeded him as king. When Jobab died, Husham, from the land of the Temanites, succeeded him as king. He defeated the Midianites in the country of Moab. The name of his city was Abith. When Husham died, Hadad, son of Bedad, succeeded him as king. When Hadad died, Samla, from Mazrekah, succeeded him as king. When Samla died, Shaul, from Rehoboth on the river, succeeded him as king. When Shaul died, Baal Hanan, son of Akbor, succeeded him as king. When Baal Hanan died, Hadar succeeded him as king. The name of the city was Pau. His wife's name was Mehetabel. She was the daughter of Matred, son of Mezahab. The following are the names of the clans of Esau individually according to their subdivisions and localities. The clans of Timnah, Alava, Jezpheth, Oholibama, Elah, Pinan, Kenaz, Teman, Mibzar, Magdiel, and Iram. These are the clans of the Edomites, according to their settlements and their territorial holdings. Esau was the father of the Edomites. I won't take a lot of time discussing this list because it is fairly tangential to the overall narrative. Its inclusion, however, in Genesis is very consistent as it does talk about the generations of the people that populate the land. It also continues to talk about that promise of God that even includes those who are not necessarily part of the covenant with Israel. This list of descendants begins with a reminder that Esau is Edom, and it says this a few times, which is also a reference to red, like his skin at birth, the red stew, and the red sandstone of the area. Then we hear again about his wives, although their names differ from the previous time they are mentioned. Scholars disagree about why this occurs, but some believe that their names were simply changed, possibly even by Esau, in order to fool his parents. It is unlikely that they represent different women, because based on the genealogy, it seems that he only had the three wives. Ultimately, this shows that Esau, like Isaac, and even Ishmael, also share in the prophecy that they will be the father of many nations. And many of these nations we will hear about later. At the time of this writing, many Israelites would be aware of Saul, Israel's first king. And that is why there is a note that these Edomite kings ruled before there was any ruler over Israel. In the historical writings, we learn that Saul fought against these clans, and later David took Edom as a vassal state. This, of course, was foreshadowed in the prophecy given to Rebekah, that the older shall serve the younger. So what can we take away from this section, as it indicates the ending of Jacob's story and the beginning of that of his children? From birth, we were introduced to Jacob as the one who would supplant his brother, and he does that through deception. In fact, this aspect of his personality remained with him throughout most of his life. He profited from it, but also was the victim to similar schemes by others. His family life was full of strife, and he constantly struggled with both God and man and women. Yet God remains faithful and continues to call him back. This is not to say that the Lord makes it easy on him. He knocks him down, quite literally, but also picks him up and shows him the way to go. On this most recent pilgrimage to Bethel, Jacob finally gives himself fully to God. He rejects any false gods changes his clothes, purifies himself, and sets up a shrine to honor the Lord. This is a sign not only of his commitment to God, but also an acknowledgement of his past, the past that he needs to let go of. This began with his dream so long ago at Bethel, when he saw the stairway to heaven. Now it comes full circle as he once again encounters God in this sacred place. We might ask ourselves where we need to return to, in a symbolic sense. When did we first believe? When did we first experience God? Maybe we were in a different place than we are now. Maybe it was an experience that changed our perspective or worldview. And when did we change our clothes and get rid of those false gods, those things that kept us from God? Did it last? Have the demands of life and relationships gotten in the way of our walk with God? 
One of the themes in the hero's journey is that of homecoming. The idea is that no one returns home the same person as when they left. How they return depends on a number of things and is reflective of how the journey changed them. Some return as heroes, stronger and wiser. Others return drained, but more self-aware. The thing about our journeys in real life is that they are almost never linear. Like Jacob, we may have many trials and aha moments. We may return multiple times, each time a little bit changed. The question that we might ask is, where is my Bethel? What do I need to do to return to the abode of God? Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope that you are enjoying your journey through the book of Genesis. Next time, we are going to begin the story of Joseph as he takes his place in this epic tale. Until then, journey home and do good.